Let's start with the first unit, general theoretical uh, considerations with a specific focus on the multimedia learning theory by Richard Meyer. First, we want to return, you know, as a sort of backbone through the whole course you're now about to finish uh, to the three perspectives, uh, the behaviorist perspective, the cognitivist perspective and the constructivist perspective. Ali has tried to, um, uh, to connect these perspectives to uh, the, the issue of online learning, uh, which is very helpful for our purpose to see how you can actually use the various perspectives to design uh, uh, online learning environments or multimedia learning environments. Let's start first with the behaviorist perspective, um, which is in fact focusing on the product or the, the, co the content of what has to be uh, taught. Um, basically, uh, the transmission model is used here. So the, the expert knows something and the student, the individual student, has to understand and apply um, uh, the knowledge or the skills that the expert wants to transmit. In fact, uh, this is one of the oldest, let's say, applications of the use of computers in education. Drill and practice, as it is called, um, with immediate informative feedback. Um, it's still uh, very lively and existing. Um, if you, for instance, know the app, which you can find on your telephone or most telephones, Duolingo, which helps you to, uh, to acquire uh, uh, vocabulary in a foreign language, uh, then you see that it, this is still a matter of drill and practice. You're provided with some uh, questions, uh, exercises, uh, which you have to answer to complete, uh, and, and then you get the immediate feedback that you write uh, with a nice, uh, a nice uh, piece of music. And uh, the next question is asked. You even see how much time you need it to find the answer, and you may use th that to speed up, you know, the uh, your 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 answering of the questions. Um, so that's 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 not that's that's uh, still existent, but it was also already be, be, uh, being used in, uh, during the seventies. When I was a student, I started in 68 and I became student assistant in 1970. I, I think it was 1970s, 1971. I um, actually joined uh, a group at uh, the Vrije Universiteit, the Department of Cognitive Psychology, which was completely devoted to using computers in education. You know, we, we're talking about 1970, eh? so we were working with what, what, what uh, then uh, were called mainframe computers. Uh, so these were, you know, these, these cabinets, three cabinets in a row with all kinds of very busy and noisy uh, equipment in it and, and uh, lights, you know, flickering, etc., etc. Uh, a very Im Im impressive, you know, kind of uh, equipment compared with the the, 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 the tiny, you know, uh, um, uh, tablets or desktop computers, you know, desktop computers we are now using, or, or laptops we are now using. Uh, and also with a very uh, modest capacity, as you may know. So um, that was the time, and we started in that project, we started to work on drill and practice programs for primary school kids. So simple uh, mental arithmetic problems, with, of course, informative feedback in which, let's say, the steps were explained to be taken when you want to subtract, let's say, uh, 25 from 42. Uh, not an easy uh, problem. Uh, you may try to do it yourself, to, uh, 25 min uh, to, uh, to 42 minus 25. So, you know, there are certain steps to be taken. There are certain, you know, um, uh, errors which you have to, to uh, try to, to prevent, etc., etc. Okay, that was the thing we did. Uh, a dictation also, so just a sentence on the screen and as soon as you had read them and started to type, you know, the sentence disappeared from the screen. You know, we, it was an alphanumeric screen as we called it, so no graphics or whatever or colors or whatever. It was just a simple oscilloscope, so to speak. 
So what kind of rules did we use at the time? The students were, the kids were enthusiastic about these very simple applications, I must say. Um, so modules, we had a separate modules, uh, clear objectives per module, um, a testing, a lot of testing, seeing whether the objectives were met by the student at the end of the module. Appropriate sequencing, which is, of course, uh, really uh, a bit of scenario and operant conditioning, in fact, from simple to complex and immediate and informative feedback, as I said. But the thing was that the, the, the child, you know, was uh, sitting in front of uh, a screen and a keyboard, you know, all keyboard, uh, pre all key, key presses were set, uh, sent, key presses were sent through the telephone to the computer, which was at the VU University in our laboratory. And the computer conceived of an answer, which was sent through the telephone line again, back to the terminal at which the student was working. So everything went through the phone and the, and the school was uh, completely, you know, uh, disconnected from the world uh, during our sessions with the kids one morning a week. It was basically, I was sitting next to the kid, you know, sh and, and trying to understand what the kids was doing. Uh, a, a very, 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 very challenging time, I must say. So, th but these were the rules we applied, you know, simple uh, uh, rules derived from the context of operant conditioning, informative feedback, uh, sequencing, and, and uh, a lot of testing. Okay, so that was the start, basically. Now, of course, we are, ha are making progress and we're now talking about, you know, the cognitivist perspective. Um, in which not only the what, you know, the, 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 the objectives are relevant, the what of teaching, but also the how, how uh, uh, skills have to be performed, um, feedback on the performance, etc., etc. Uh, skills training, decontextualized simulations and games, so simple simulations and games, and also intelligent tutoring systems. We are going to discuss that later on. So we do have here the simple computer assisted instruction in which, you know, the machine de um, uh, determines what, uh, what, what the next question or the next problem is. And the machine is completely devoted to providing, you know, these problems in a proper order, in a proper sequence. Uh, but um, we also have here more advanced uh, applications which can also be, uh, 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 let's say, enriched with a lot of intelligence. And then we're talking about intelligence tutoring systems. I've um, uh, included uh, uh, two examples. I'm not completely sure what happens when I uh, click on it, but we'll see. Well, basically nothing happens. I um, oh, we have to allow, um, uh, allow pop-ups. Yes, here we are. Sorry, um, I had to, uh, should have prepared that in advance. So here is, but then again, we don't see anything whatsoever. Um, so we return to our, um, perhaps the other one is more interesting. No, again, I'm sorry, these examples um, are not available. Perhaps when you do it yourself, I will, uh, 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 you know, include links to these presentations, to these prezies um, in, on, on the Canvas website and you can try to find the examples yourself. Okay, what kind of example, uh, what kind of guidelines do we have here? Um, first of all, uh, so it's a lot more basically because we are now talking about computers which have graphics facilities, which have color, which have you know, video possibilities, etc. All these things were not available uh, in the beginning, so when everything started. So use these facilities, use these uh, uh, possibilities, color graphics, to draw the attention of the learner to the proper information on the screen. So, uh, at, at, you know, at, uh, attention, at, um, uh, drawing attention is an, an important issue in these more advanced and, and richer, but also complexer sources of, of information. Adapt the level of difficulty to the cognitive level uh, of the learner. So we have here a form of personalized education. Use advanced organizers to, active, to activate prerequisite knowledge and skills, uh, to make these skills and knowledge active. Provide conceptual models to help learners retrieve and build mental models. So show a model of what has to be understood and has to be mastered 
uh, the, the skill or the complex problem solving uh, 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 strategy. And these models will help the student to build their own mental models of what has to be done, what has to be accomplished. Chunk information to prevent cognitive overload, we are going to discuss that later on. Uh, foster deprocessing, which is typically something uh, which is relevant for the cognitivist perspective. So asking children to, bar to build concept maps and to do all kinds of, of, of uh, assignments which help them to, to actually process the information and in a, a, at a deep level and not at a surface level. Provide materials in different modes for different learning styles. Some students prefer, you know, more visual oriented materials and other students prefer more text oriented materials. Motivate learners to learn, do pay attention to motivation, uh, foster self-regulated learning and foster transfer of learning. All, kind, all, all concepts, you know, which are very relevant and, 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 and important in the, in the cognitivist perspective. Okay, so these are, you know, guidelines which has to be, have to be followed up, can be followed up by designers of, uh, of uh, education software, uh, which uh, designers who do take the cognitivist perspective as a point of departure. Okay, let's now take the constructivist perspective into account. Um, and then we are talking uh, about the what and the how of what has to be acquired, but also the why. So the conditions uh, which determine whether a particular strategy, when a particular strategy, wh whether and when a particular strategy can be um, implemented and used in order to solve a particular problem. So we are now talking about games, serious games, multiplayer serious games, contextualized simulations, rich simulations, and also computer-supported collaborative learning. So these issues will return later on in this module. Um, um, and the guidelines uh, are again in the next slide. Um, <clears throat> of course, you, 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 uh, ho I hope you do recognize them because we have been talking about these various perspectives time and again. So I, I hope they are now f a bit familiar for you. So let learners, of course, construct their own knowledge, the constructivist aspect of constructivism and also foster collaborative learning, the social aspect of constructivism or social constructivism, if you like. So the collaboration between students is also very important and is seen as an important, let's say, ingredient, uh, a precondition even for, uh, uh, for appropriate learning. Give learners control of the learning process, give learners time and opportunity to reflect. We also will discuss that later on and make learning a meaningful endeavor. That is to say that uh, as far as motivation is concerned, um, um, uh, according to the constructivist perspective, st children should, should understand the meaning of what they are doing and uh, also, uh, uh, let's say, build their own, let's say, uh, uh, sense in what they are doing. So, uh, so meaningful has a meaning in two directions. First, in terms of the curriculum, uh, activities should be meaningful in order to meet ends which are de determined within the curriculum but also meaningful uh, as far as the perspective of the student is concerned. So the student should, consider, should understand the meaning of what she or he is doing. Okay, so these guidelines are important when you create serious games and uh, in, 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 in which you want the students to, uh, to, to, to work with in order to understand a particular subject matter area. Okay, or even construct, you know, the knowledge about that particular subject matter area. Okay, so far the three perspectives. Now we are uh, focusing on multimedia learning, the, the, the theory by Richard Meyer. I have added a reference here, multimedia learning, a book which contains his insights, I think, uh, well, as far as as the continuing development of the theory is concerned, of course, that never ends. But this is about it's 2009, and I think the first decade of this t century was the time that Richard Meyer actually, together with his, col his colleagues, developed and published his uh, multimedia learning theory. So we are talking about three assumptions, so basic assumptions. Then we are talking about representing incoming information. And then the third and most, perhaps most important part of the theory 
is reducing cognitive load. So that is the core, I think, of the theory. Um, uh, Meyer did in, indeed uh, use the, uh, the ideas of John Sweller and, and the people uh, working on these issues at the Open University at the time, uh, Paul Kirchner, Jeroen van Meijenboer, etc. So he used that domain, that, that, that let's say, uh, that theoretical framework to discuss how uh, pictures and text should be combined in order to provide uh, uh, information to the student which can be grasped and can be pr processed in an appropriate way. Okay, we start with the three assumptions. The first assumption is the dual channels assumption. That is to say that humans possess separate channels for processing visual and auditory information. So now you are reading and perhaps also viewing my, my uh, talking head in the corner of your screen and you are also listening to what I say. So there are two streams of information entering your head and uh, the, the idea is that they, these two streams of information are processed separately at least until they arrive at working memory. So then there, is, there, there needs to be a sort of integration of the streams of information. But before um, uh, entering working memory, these streams originating from different senses uh, actually uh, are uh, processed independently and, and simultaneously. This is already, uh, this is old stuff, you know, in, within cognitive psychology. This was already developed, these ideas, by Alan Paivio in the 70s, I guess it was. So the idea that visual and uh, textual or auditory information are processed independently and can compete. Uh, and that's also a the, the, the whole issue of, of cognitive load comes uh, into play, uh, these streams of information can compete when they, you know, both uh, sort of, you know, jump on the working memory capacity. So then we're talking about the second assumption, the limited capacity assumption. Humans are limited in the amount of material they can process in each channel at one time. So the, the channels end, so to speak, in working memory. And according to, let's say, people like Baddeley and you, working memory actually has separate, let's say, uh, 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 compartments dealing with these uh, different types of information. So there is something like a visual spatial, visual spatial loop and an auditory loop. So and these two systems, they work together. Well, they work separately, but they both take you know capacity from working memory and this capacity is limited so therefore they are competing within working memory and then this the third assumption is the active processing assumption human humans engage in active learning by attending to relevant incoming material organizing selected material into a coherent mental representations and integrating mental representations with other knowledge. So this is the, ho the whole idea about what's going on, you know, in long-term memory, where the integration takes place and the integration needs to take place in order to, to be able to use the, the knowledge which has been acquired in the, in the, in the future. If you don't, you know, uh, Meyer has also emphasized that in other publications and a lot of people have done so, you when you acquire new knowledge, it is connected to the existing knowledge. And only through the existing knowledge, you can reach the new knowledge. So when there is not a close connection between given and new, uh, then there is no way you could address new information, new knowledge in your, in your long-term memory, because you can't find it, basically. So therefore, this integration, this connection is very important, the coherence created by uh, using mental representations, mental models, for instance, sort of, you know, complete you know, organizations of knowledge which describe a particular phenomenon or a particular subject matter uh, area, whatever. So the integration takes place active, uh, by, by active processing by the learner in long-term memory. 
So these three assumptions, the du dual channels assumption, the limited capacity assumption, and the active processing assumption are, let's say, the, the fundament, uh, the foundation of uh, 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 Richard Meyer's multimedia learning theory. Uh, let's see what happens uh, when uh, information is uh, 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 presented to the system. So we have images, we have words. Th these images and words are selected and are organized and integrated. That's the basic idea. These five processes are, of course, very important. We already discussed these processes. But let's have a look at the, the three-channel model. You know the Atkinson and Schifrin model we did uh, discuss this model in the in the knowledge and memory uh, module so I hope you recognize it we have the presentation of multimedia words and pictures we have the senses um, the sensory memory systems in the ears and the eyes in this case words are uh, 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 received by the ear but also seen by the eyes and and pictures are of course processed by the eyes and by selecting information from these sensory memories, these, uh, these separate uh, independent sensory memories, sounds and images enter working memory. So here's a selection process. And these sounds and images are, as we said, in a dual channel model, uh, uh, um, separately stored in working memory. And uh, they are integrated, as, as, as you see in this picture, in verbal models uh, and organized uh, in uh, pictorial models so they are integrated so when I tell you a story I, I, I pronounce sentences you know and these sentences are passed so you you create a, a sort a sort of deep level model you have the situation model the surface model so to speak and then you gradually create a situation model in which you uh, find the, the the connection between the various you know concepts and and, and uh, their relationships and that's what what you build up, gradually build up the verbal model then you have a verbal model the story and you have a pictorial model perhaps pictures which are relevant uh, uh pictures of words also but also pictures uh, of photographs of whatever um, uh, describing the, the the event and these are integrated and together with prior knowledge they are understood and are stored in long term long term memory. So this is the whole, you know, these are the, 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 the core processes uh, distinguished by Richard Meyer in his multimedia learning theory. Okay. Now we are talking about reducing cognitive load. That's the, the, the core of the theory. And now we have uh, various effects. Um, I think I'm going to discuss seven. Uh, the, the, the paper uh, discusses nine ways to reduce cognitive load. Uh, you can find it in the educational psychologist and then you can also uh, try to find out where the, 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 two, the two went, which uh, apparently are not going to be discussed here. Anyway, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the visual channel, as we have seen, uh, may got overloaded because of uh, essential material is too much. So um, um, that may happen, uh, perha perhaps when I would not talk, uh, so I would present the information on the screen in text and then it would be processed through the visual channel. And when I have too much information on the screen, then there is a, a, a certain uh, amount of overload. So you probably know the six by six rule. I hope you know it. Whenever you prepare a sheet uh, with words on it, then uh, you should never include more than six lines and never include more than six words per line. So if you uh, try to, to get something from this course, this basic course in teaching and learning, you might uh, remember, try to remember this rule and apply it, apply it so everybody will enjoy your, sh your uh, slides in the future when you apply this rule the six by six rule m not more than six words per line not more than six lines per slide and um, if you uh, do not apply this rule and uh, include more information then you get this this phenomenon of visual overload uh, and then um, uh, what Meyer is, is is actually here 
uh, uh, underlining and, and has actually shown with, uh, of course, with research, it's all evidence-based, what he's uh, uh, emphasizing here is the modality effect that you, in this case, uh, get a better transfer if the, the information is presented as in, in, uh, in narration than in on-screen text. The, so a lot of text does not help. Uh, but should be, uh, let's say, replaced by a story, by narration, by, by words, spoken words. Okay, uh, there's also a possibility that both channels are overloaded with essential material. And then uh, Meyer uh, identifies two effects, the segmentation effect and the pre-training effect. Um, of course, you can imagine that when there is a, a, the, the danger of, of, of overloading both channels, uh, then you should uh, leave the control to the student. So the student should be able to, to segment and to, to choose segments um, 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 uh, and, and when processing the information instead of, you know, having this information sort of, you know, uh, come over the student without the possibility to 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 intervene and to to pace the uh, the stream of information. So that's the segmentation effect and the pre-training effect. Well, of course, you can imagine that when students are already aware of the the meaning of concepts of components of a system, for instance, uh, and understand these components, then they have. Uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, prerequisite knowledge, and this prerequisite knowledge may help them to understand the more complex issue. And that's what is called the pre-training effect. So you should try to segment or to, to, to sequence, you know, your course in such a way that you gradually, uh, 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 let's say, display or uh, uh, present information to the student who has the ability to gradually uh, build up his or her uh, mental model of the information you present, the pre-training effect. Okay, that's the first, the first two. We are still, uh, we have still a lot of uh, these principles to go. Um, so when one or bo of both channels are overloaded with extraneous material, so um, a material which is not very essential to the message you want to convey uh, in your uh, program, then uh, there is the coherence effect. Um, so you should exclude the irrelevant or extraneous material um, and, and the signaling effect. Um, um, so when signals are included, pointing towards what is essential, then the student can use these signals to just to discard, you know, the information which is not very relevant, apparently not very relevant. Okay. Uh, there is also the possibility that the, the way, you know, the information is presented is not very clear cut. Uh, so there is something like a confusion. Then there is what, what uh, there are two effects, the spatial contiguity effect and the redundancy effect. Um, then you should better organize, basically, that's what uh, Meyer is saying, um, the information by, for instance, uh, placing words near co corresponding parts of pictures of graphics. And when words are presented as an oration rather than as oration on and on screen text. So you just leave out the on screen text and just talk. So the talking hat should do the work whenever the uh, things become complicated, which perhaps may be the case in this particular situation. I hope not. But, uh, you know, all these effects have been have been substantiated by empirical evidence and uh, they, they can be, you know, organized in, in a way which uh, you know, which is possible because of this general model of the way information is processed. Okay, and then we have um, um, the effect, um, um, uh, the temporal contiguity effect and the spatial ability effect. Again, when there is an overload in both channels, uh, the temporal contiguity effect. Now, when that's again, that's that, that's a sort of you know that resembles the idea of of the. Uh, the, this location of pictures and words uh, together in order to be able to, for the student to uh, understand them uh, in an integrated way. And uh, again, animation narration should be presented simultaneously rather than successively. Again, that uh, provides a student with the opportunity to integrate both information streams and the spatial ability effect. 
um, there are differences between students as far as they are able to process uh, spatial information and high spatial learners benefit more from well-designed instruction than low spatial learners. Uh, of course, th that makes sense when you do use the spatial arrangement organization of your information then of course students who are able to process these spatial cues uh, are, are better off than students who are not very let's say sensitive to these uh, spatial arrangements okay so that that that's basically what we uh, what i would like to to uh, to explain as far as the multimedia learning learning theory uh, of um, uh, richard meyer um, is concerned uh, perha perhaps you should consult the original papers, uh, for instance, this one uh, in the Education Psychologist, which gives a very clear cut explanations of all of these principles. I've tried, you know, to, to condense uh, them a little bit here in order to be able to present them and not overload your uh, working memory with, uh, with uh, textual information. Another thing which you should keep in mind, and which is almost always true, um, Whenever you are uh, in an audience and you are presented with a slide uh, with too much information, um, uh, perhaps this is already a bit uh, uh, an example of a slide because I, I just uh, uh, just counted the lines and you see there's I think seven lines, which is perhaps one line too much. Anyway, um, when you are presented with a slide with a lot of information, with sentences, without white space, etc., then it's almost always the case that the presenter did not have or did not take the time um, to reduce the information on the slide. So he just copied and pasted information from, uh, from papers or whatever other sources he had at hand. So that, that, is, that is almost always the case, that, which is to say that it takes time to reduce information on a slide. You have to reformulate and reconsider and rethink what you want to convey with your slide in order to be able to arrive at the core of your message. And it, it, you should take this time to, to reformulate because otherwise, you know, you're just overloading your audience with information, which doesn't make sense and make them even, uh, they may annoy them, etc., etc. So whenever you see such a, sli a slide, uh, you, you might ask for a condensed, you know, summary of what's on the slide, because as we said, as we saw, that, that may help you to understand and to represent the information on the slide. Okay, but keep it in mind that take your time to, prep to prepare slides. Okay, so that's uh, the, 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 that's the upshot of, of, of Meyer, Meyer's multimedia learning theory. Of course, there's a lot of more to say about it, but we leave it here for this moment as in this introduction. And then I would like to remind you uh, of uh, an issue I, I raised myself uh, in, in a previous uh, module on, on, I think it was the module on metacognition and self-regulation, um, um, in which we discussed the need to find a balance between structure and freedom in learning environments and also, of course, in technology enhanced learning environments. Um, the student should uh, receive, uh, uh, should, should, should be able to operate, to construct, you know, knowledge herself or himself. So there should be amount of freedom. We also encountered that in Meyer's theory because Meyer said, well, well whenever there's a sort of overload of information threatening the situation, then uh, if you give the student the opportunity to choose and to pace and to sequence, then the student may actually arrive at a better uh, situation where information can be the, uh, uh, can be uh, processed in in, 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 in in the speed the student and the, the pace the student is able to handle. Okay, so freedom is necessary, but also structure. Structure is also necessary. Um, uh, so what what I said here, blended is better than online, uh, but do not forget the teacher. That is to say that. When you have a combination of uh, online learning and uh, more traditional forms of learning, like paper and pencil or discussion or, or meetings with students and teachers, etc., outside you know, the, the computer, 
controlled situation, computer mediated situation, then that is better than only the the uh, the online situation. Uh, do not forget the teacher who is also, of course, outside of the computer, so to speak. So the computer is never, 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 never a replacement of the teacher, and the teacher is is able to do uh, the things he or she is actually the expert in. Um, uh, instead of you know providing in uh, sums or, or providing problems or whatever, which could also be done by a computer. So in my view, um, the best situation arises when the more dull aspects of teaching are taken care of by the computer and the teacher has the freedom to really use his or her expertise and wisdom to help students to acquire uh, understanding or, and develop their, their, their skills and attitudes. Okay, um, so structure the task and a certain appropriate level of prerequisite knowledge. It's a bit like what Mario was saying that, you know, the, uh, the pre-training effect. So uh, try to, to, to activate prerequisite knowledge and structure the task, so sequence the task in a proper way, etc. cetera. Um, uh, what we also saw in that previous uh, module, uh, no self-regulated learning unless domain knowledge. So domain knowledge is a sort of prerequisite in order to... Uh, for the student to be able to develop, you know, at the meta level, these st strategies and skills which may help them, may help him or her to, uh, let's say, um, meet with uh, requirements in new situations. No self-regulated learning unless lots of practice, lots of practice, 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 which is often forgotten in, in, in these complex learning environments. And, uh, and, lo and not, uh, no self-regulated learning unless the necessary structure is gradually faded. So the, here we are talking about the scaffolding, you know, uh, the scaffolding situation in which the, the support by the teacher is gradually taken away in order to be, to be able for the student to develop his or her own control of the learning environment. Okay, so these, these five rules are also, I think, uh, substantiated by a lot of evidence and may also be uh, considered as uh, important theoretical considerations when we talk about multimedia learning.